months later. It was about a six-month process. We had this meeting, and I, I said, look, we've got all this science that shows problems. You've got science that you claim doesn't show problems. Why don't we just together come up with a, um, a committee that we could agree on, of scientists, and have them look at all the data, your data, our data, everybody's data, and see what the data says? And uh, he had some people on his staff that were proposing that, and he had uh, one guy who was a, um, a scientist, science advisor who was hysterical in this meeting about not allowing that to happen. Rumsfeld maintained himself in a balanced way in this meeting, but then over the next six months, gradually uh, they decided not to do the proposal that I made, not to do any looking at the data, but rather to treat the whole thing as a legal political battle. And they went ahead and, uh, and, and fought it through legally and politically with lobbyists and so forth and uh, were able to, um, uh, able to basically use Rumsfeld's tools to get the thing through. How do these people sleep, Jim? <laughs> well, I don't, think, I don't think Rumsfeld has much empathy for anyone outside of his own very narrow circle. He, he does not value the lives of other people particularly. Uh, he's, uh, his, I don't think he even understands that that's a part of what the deal is. Uh, his notion is that he was hired to turn Cyril around. It was about to go out of business. And, and make money for stockholders. And, and, and for himself. He got a $12 million bonus for getting this thing through the FDA, a personal $12 million bonus. Just on this deal. Just on this deal. And, um, and that's, that's chicken feed in today's world, but back in 1985, that was... <laughs> that's a lot of money. A nice, a nice bit of change. I know some people who could live well on that, let me tell you. Yeah, but probably not the people in Rubsville's class. <laughs> they need more than that. But it's a, it's a, it's a shocking story to watch because uh, uh, the, uh, uh, we've had um, uh, thousands of people call us, talk to them. We've had meetings with them. I mean, these people whose lives have been... Uh, it's just essentially ruined, uh, you know, from people who uh, one one woman early on was an artist uh, who lost the sight in one eye um, and basically lost her, her, her career as an artist. Uh, but you talk to these people and you realize, and, and basically the way she found out about the, uh, the harm was that her doctor uh, uh, couldn't understand, his, her eye doctor couldn't understand why she was having these vision problems. And he went through everything in her diet, in her home cleaning and uh, products and everything that, that was, uh, she was coming in contact with. And it was NutraSweet uh, aspartame that had methyl alcohol in it. Methyl alcohol is known to cause blindness. Doesn't it also break down at a certain temperature and turns into formaldehyde? That's exactly right. It does. Isn't that embalming fluid? That is. That's exactly <laughs> what it is. That's exactly what it is. And it was, it was interesting because early on, even the Soft Drink Association um, uh, made uh, noises about opposing uh, NutraSweet um, because of that fact. If it, if it gets over 80 degrees, about 80 degrees, it breaks down. And uh, the argument that the, uh, that the uh, company, Cyril, made to the FDA was, yes, but as it breaks down, its flavor is so bad that nobody would actually drink it. Um, that's a cynical argument in and of itself, but also it's not necessarily true because it starts breaking down and the flavor doesn't actually get bad until after it's uh, pretty well broken down. Now, how did these brilliant marketeers then, how did they take this product that had no sales, that got approved by the FDA through a very cloudy way, how did they begin to market it? to the soda companies and the other companies? Well, they, they are very, there's a very interesting story there. Um, there were, uh, the, 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 in 1980, it was approved in 1981 for dry foods, and uh, there began to be complaints, and there were about 600 complaints at FDA. It was only marketed in Arizona at that point as a, as a test market. And they got about 600 complaints, and they were sent to the CDC to be evaluated. And the CDC um, uh, made a very interesting statement. They said, we're looking at people who have complained about NutraSweet uh, consumption. They con consume NutraSweet and they have problems. We cannot tell you whether the NutraSweet caused those problems or not because everybody ate it. So we don't have a double-blind situation. But we will evaluate what we have here. And what they found was that about 25 to 30 percent of the female users uh, had um, – uh, problems like seizures and uh, headaches and uh, uh, dizziness and so forth, um, and they would, the problems would go away when they stopped NutraSweet, and then when they took NutraSweet back on, the problems would come back. 
So they, mm. they made some very interesting uh, statements about the problems. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, after a lot of struggle and, and, and push and pull, uh, that study was finally released uh, by the FDA. We had uh, worked hard to get it out. And fascinatingly enough, Pepsi-Cola, the day that study was released, Pepsi-Cola had an international, worldwide, huge blowout series of press conferences about how they were going to add NutraSweet to Pepsi-Cola. They just completely blew the story of its problems off out of the news media. Now, the important point there is that the uh, head of Pepsi-Cola, Don Kendall, was one of the key advisors to the White House at the time, the, you know, informal kitchen cabinet type advisor, right. at the time that Rumsfeld was working in the White House. And in fact, Rumsfeld and Kendall had a very close personal relationship. So here you see the old boys network working very, very hard, and uh, they, they blasted this thing out through that, uh, that particular um, press, press briefing. It was huge press briefing worldwide. Um, in addition to that, they did almost simultaneously to that, a little bit before, but close to it, uh, they blast, or maybe it was actually a little bit after, I think. They uh, sent uh, just about every household in America got a little uh, bubble gum wrap, uh, uh, bub- gumballs sent to them with NutraSweet in it as a huge, um, as a huge PR campaign. It's important to note that when Rumsfeld went to to Cyril, he took three uh, political operatives with him, people who were politicians. And those politicians, did, they did one thing which was really interesting, and that is that they, uh, uh, for the first time, they branded a... Um, By the a, way, we asked, we asked for a statement from uh, various companies involved uh, in, uh, in aspartame, and nobody answered. And it should be noted that there was a protest by the National Soft Drink Association before all this happened. So all of a sudden... They changed their mind after protesting. That's in the congressional record. Well, the interesting thing there is that when the uh, when they uh, protested, which was in uh, uh, early in the early uh, 70s, 73, 74. And also, period, didn't they ask the FDA in '83 to delay approval of aspartame? The the National Soft Drink Association went to the FDA and said, "Don't put it in yet because we want further testing." So it somebody was a got to earlier. Them. It was a little earlier. They actually approved it. It was actually approved in 81. And uh, before that, the soft drink people had said, look, I think we're going to have some problems here. And what's interesting is that the influence, the heavy influence in the soft drink association at the time there was the objections was Coca-Cola. But then the balance of power kind of shifted to Pepsi-Cola in the soft drink association and basically Pepsi signed on as the great promoter of NutraSweet. Then what happened is the um, the uh, deal that that Cyril ran was so tough that it was virtually impossible to put a diet soda on the market without NutraSweet in it. And uh, they they basically uh, bought. Uh, they, 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 you might have been able to have a competition between saccharin and NutraSweet, except that they created a deal where the product they put in was part saccharin and part NutraSweet. So that they got their their uh, product in without having a direct competition, then then they put heavy heavy duties on the on the cost of this of this sweetener, and it was uh, there were many many companies that were very resistant and unhappy, but ultimately it was all they were all whipped into shape by the market power that uh, that Rumsfeld was able to create. Well, it's just amazing, Jim, how they can get a product like this to market and push for it and use the good old boy network to do it. In a moment, we'll be joined with Dr. Betty Martini and Stephen Fox, who's very active in consumer protection. Thank you, Jim Turner. We'll be back in a moment. Wow.